Welcome to the Herald Democrat Sports Podcast. I'm the sports editor of the Herald Democrat, Jason Del Rosa, and you're listening to the Herald Democrat Sports Podcast. We are approaching the middle of the football season. We are at week four. We're not there just yet, but we're starting to get more people into district play. People are finishing non-district games this week. Uh, we had some interesting results come out of uh, week three, so we'll talk about that, and we'll look ahead to what is in store for week four of this football season. And unfortunately, we'll start on a sad note. Uh, we will mention the one team that will not be playing this week, uh, that being the Whitesboro Bearcats. Uh, unfortunately, uh, their game has been canceled uh, against the Sulphur Bulldogs. They were going to go up into Oklahoma for their game this week uh, to get ready for uh, 4-3A Division One district action starting next week. Uh, and over the weekend, I'm sure everybody has seen um, or heard that uh, Sulphur's head coach, Jim Dixon, uh, passed away. He had been in intensive care uh, last week due to a medical emergency um, and was not at their game last week against their rival, Davis, and then passed away on Sunday. Um, so Whitesboro uh, and Sulphur obviously agreed to not play that game, uh, which makes total sense considering the, the circumstance. And Whitesboro was not uh, attempting to find a replacement opponent this week. Uh, they're just going to take... Uh, a bye week, uh, a double bye essentially, uh, and get ready for Pilot Point, who they're going to host next week. Um, so uh, Whitesboro will not be playing this week as scheduled. Uh, they did play last week, and they were uh, they did remain undefeated, and they did have a close game uh, once again as they beat uh, Pottsboro in the Battle of the Boroughs, 35 to 27. Uh, another comeback victory in the fourth quarter, led by Mac Harper. Um, he scored the deciding touchdown for. The second straight week, uh, this time uh, with a little over four minutes left, and and Whitesboro was able to uh, hold off the Cardinals uh, to get that win as they scored uh, uh, the final two touchdowns of that game to rally uh, and win the game uh, 35-27. Uh, uh, Grayson Ledbetter back in the lineup this week uh, at running back, 21 carries, 182 yards, and uh, two touchdowns. Um, he had the, the touchdown that actually uh, gave them the lead at 28-20. I guess tied the game at 27 um, because uh, when Harper scored, they went for two. So that would have been a that would have tied the score uh, early in the fourth quarter. Um, and then um, Harper had the game winner. Um, he finished with uh, 20 carries, excuse me, 10 carries for 103 yards. Um, and he had a touchdown run in the third quarter as well. Um, he was also 11 of 17 passing for 110 yards uh, and a touchdown to Carter Sluter in the first quarter. Um, Jay Sanders actually led them in receiving five ca- catches for 61 yards. Uh, Sluter added three for 33 with his touchdown. Um, Whitesboro finished with 301 yards on the ground, uh, 110 through the air. Um, and, and another, um, you know, really solid win because we're talking about, you know, this was a matchup that was, was three, and, um, you know, three and over. So, uh, um, first three and uh, obviously it's a rivalry game that's back on the schedule, uh, for the first time for these kids to be able to play in. Cause the last time they played this game, um, you know, it was before they were in high school. Uh, and so uh, another, another really good win against what's probably, you know, Potsburg's expected to make the playoffs in their district. Um, so another good win against another quality opponent, um, after beating bells, uh, in comfort behind fashion as well. Um, and so it's going to be interesting. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about uh, a little more with their district um, next week as we as we get ready to preview those games. Um, but obviously, you know, they they have been dealing with some injuries. Um, so so it's an extra week to get healthy. You don't have to worry about guys getting hurt right before um, uh, district play. So there is there is uh, a silver lining uh, if you're if you're not going to play going into district that might be um, advantageous for them. And th- and there are you know continue to be. The, the big expectations, I know, um, you know, people are looking at Brock, and, and we'll talk about Brock here in a little bit um, because of, of the big matchup that they have. Uh, you know, they haven't won a game, but they've played a really tough schedule. But, you know, until somebody beats them in that district, you know, they are the favorite. Um, but I think I think it's right now it's pretty easy um, if you're Whitesboro to say we are at least the second best team in that district. Um, and we'll d- dive into that further. But so, unfortunately, Whitesboro – uh, was scheduled to go up into Oklahoma, a, a rare, a rarity for them um, to cross to cross state lines to play an opponent, and, uh, and that would have obviously been a very interesting matchup 
um, to to see because uh, Salford was coming off, um, you know, the, their their rivalry win. Um, so that would have been an interesting matchup for sure um, for Whitesboro. But so that's so we start on a sad note there. Um, and we'll get into the rest of the, the games that are actually going to be played this week. Um, we work our way from top to bottom. And uh, at the top, both of our 5As are, are full-fledged in the district now uh, with this week. Uh, the Sherman Bearcats last week started district play. They were the lone team to uh, to be in a district battle last week. Uh, and unfortunately, they did come up short uh, against Frisco Centennial at home, 14-7. Uh, they lost the defensive slugfest there. Uh, so they're now 1-2 and two and 0-1 and in district play. And they are actually playing on Thursday night um, at Frisco Lebanon Trail, uh, 7 p.m. Thursday at uh, uh, Kuykendall Stadium. That's that's what Memorial Stadium was. They renamed it uh, recently. So if if you're if you're confused when you hear that name, just think of where the old Memorial Stadium was in Frisco, and that's where uh, that's where they're gonna play. Uh, Frisco Lebanon Trail actually had the district by last week, so they are 0-2. Uh, they lost to Van Alstine. Um, uh, Van Alstine came from behind. We talked about that that last week uh, to win that game, 30 to 26. And uh, Lebanon Trail, uh, we mentioned of course uh, after the first week of action because they played Princeton before Sherman played Princeton, and uh, they lost to the Panthers, uh, 14 to seven. So if you are the Bearcats looking to bounce back, that is a good note that you beat Princeton by four. They lost to Princeton by a touchdown. So if you want to play the transitive property, are you 10 points better? Are you maybe a two touchdowns better than uh, Lebanon Trail? Um, obviously, you know, they didn't play last week. So um, that's going to be interesting to see how that affects them. And, of course, you have Sherman coming off this loss um, uh, against Centennial. And we, we talked about that could potentially be, a, a, you know, a key game. You know, they have these two games, and then Sherman's going to go into their bye next week. Um, and we thought that, you know, looking at it, they could have a, a chance to be – um, you know, two and zero in district play, and kind of reassess where things happen. And we'll touch on some of the other district scores too, because um, there were some interesting scores uh, for the first week of District Five A. Um, but from Sherman's perspective, they jump out to to a lead uh, in the first quarter. Uh, Vontrell Sanders again gets gets deep uh, for for a touchdown pass. Um, you know, gets behind gets behind some guys, and the next thing you know, sixty three yards later, he's in the end zone. Sherman's up seven nothing. You're thinking. Okay, here we go. Good start. They had a good start against Princeton um, as well with, with some long touchdowns. Um, but unfortunately, after that, the the offense kind of kind of uh, went quiet. That was the only touchdown, obviously, that Sherman had. Um, defense obviously played played you know pretty well. Um, you only give up two touchdowns. Um, they were they were both uh one was a long run uh, in the second quarter uh, that tied it, and then in the third quarter, Centennial went ahead um, with another touchdown drive. Um, you know, and you look, you look at the numbers and, and it was, it was, it, it looks like it was a very bend, uh, don't break type of a game. Um, you know, Centennial put up over 400 yards, uh, and it was very balanced. They had 206 rushing and 209 passing, but they only scored, you know, two touchdowns and they didn't have a ton of turnovers. Uh, Connor Clark did have a, an interception, um, in the end zone that obviously ended up, what could have been some points there to keep it close. Um, but just, uh, obviously a very frustrating game when you, when you hold somebody, um, you know, to 14 points, uh, and you, you know, you, you come up short, uh, with only seven of your own. Um, and, and all three of Sherman's games so far have been close. Uh, obviously they, you know, they end up losing by seven, uh, in the battle of the ax. They win by four against Princeton in a game where they could have driven down and won, um, with a touchdown, uh, by three points. And then obviously this game is decided by a touchdown as well. So, um, definitely frustrating. Hopefully, you know, for Sherman's sake, uh, they don't have a, uh, a close game, uh, this week, but they've got, you know, like I said, they've got some guys that have been making plays, uh, you know, Sanders in this one, three catches for 81 yards on the touchdown. Um, you know, the, the running game has been a little bit better for Sherman this year. We've seen that, um, you know, with some guys and, and, and this one, Caleb, Caleb Thompson, again, leads the way. He had 16 carries for 56 yards. Phoenix Grant added six carries for 34 yards, um, as well. Um, uh, Grant did have two interceptions. Um, one of those, uh, they were both, uh, in the second half. I think the one was at the end when they were trying to drive, um, to potentially tie the game. Um, and, uh, was only, uh, only had 135 yards passing and 63 of it, you know, came on that one, uh, on that one pass. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously a struggle there. Um, 
and if you're if you're Sherman, you're like, you know, we've had all these close games. We've been very inconsistent. Um, you know, you know, one week we look good doing this, and then another week we look good doing that. Um, so I, I I know it's I know it's frustrating. You never want to start 0-1 um, in district play. Um, and and like we said, this 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 is a you don't want to say it's a it's a must win. Um, but in such a large district, anybody that starts 0-2 um, is going to have trouble digging out of that hole. Um, and this is a this is a game where you know Lebanon Trail has not has not um, you know they haven't won yet, um, and they've struggled to score. You know they've they scored seven points against Princeton. Uh, you know that was a game like I said Sherman won 34 to 30. Um, to kind of if you want to compare that, and then last week or two weeks ago against Van Alstyn, they only scored 26 points. Um, so you'd like to think if you're Sherman, you can go in. I, obviously, it's an early, early scheduled game on a Thursday. Um, so that that's a little that's might change your schedule a little bit. But I think you know you, you've got to play with a real sense of urgency um, in this district because, like we said, you know there's a lot of games left. But that means you, there's more teams that you have to jump over if you want to try to get in the mix. Um, and there were some interesting scores from the first week of district play um, on Thursday before everybody else got going. Uh, on Friday, people saw, oh, hey, Her- Frisco Heritage beat Frisco Wakeland. Um, Frisco Wakeland was presumed to be a playoff team, um, presumed to be a contender for um, the district championship, um, and they come up uh, short against Heritage, which is which was surprising. Um, and then on Friday, um, Frisco Reedy beat Frisco Lone Star uh, in a defensive battle 13-7, and... Um, one that says how good obviously one star's defense is um uh, to hold Reedy down based on what they had done uh to their first couple of opponents including Denison um but obviously it says a lot about um Reedy's, Reedy's defense as well which has been really good um through the three games as well so um but that was a kind of surprise i think a lot of people thought um you know that's that was going to be one of those key games and i don't know if anybody thought 13 to 7 was going to be it but you couple that with Wakeland's loss and now Reedy is easily, you know, sort of the inside favorite or that has the inside track because they already have a win over Lone Star. Um, and I think right now, um, based on the teams that are 1-0, um, you know, the top two teams, uh, you know, in the running to, to for that district title or to, to kind of keep pace at the top is, is Reedy and Frisco. Um, Frisco beat a bad uh, Frisco Liberty team 63-7. to um, They're the only team, Frisco Liberty, uh, Liberty and Lebanon Trail, are the only two teams in the district that don't have uh, victories on the season yet, um, and and Liberty's been outscored uh, almost by 100 points in just three games. So um, that that final was not uh, very surprising. Um, but um, Frisco and Centennial are playing uh, the same night. Sherman and Lebanon Ontario are playing, so we'll know half the district scores right there. Um, and Reedy and Wakeland are playing on on Friday. So uh, Reedy got. The two uh, right off the bat that you thought were going to be uh, contenders, and so uh, if they come out of that two and zero, then you know I think it's pretty safe to say that whenever they play uh, Frisco, uh, that's going to be interesting. And then and then just to throw this in, uh, when Sherman has the bye next week, um, Wakeland and Lone Star play. So all the big dogs are really playing each other right at the start to kind of set up that pecking order, and then it's going to be a question of who can knock somebody off along the way. Um, but obviously some, some interesting scores in, in 6-5-A. Um, I, like I said, if you're Sherman, you want to get to 1-1 one and, one, and you want to reevaluate where you are um, in the standings uh, with everybody playing when, when you're sitting it out uh, next week. Um, and then Sherman jumps right back in with Frisco. So um, like I said, it's going to be – it's going to be – it's tough. I think it's going to be tough sledding in this district um, for a lot of teams. Um, and I think there's going to be – I mean, it's, it, it is kind of interesting to see – that some of the score, you know, three of the three of the four scores that we saw on opening night um, were 19-13, 14-7, 13-7. So I don't know if that means this is a low-scoring district as opposed to one of those districts where you know first one in the 40s wins because um, every game is a shootout. We had three out of four games were um, were defensive uh, defensive slugfests, um, and unfortunately Sherman wasn't able to to come out on top of theirs. So uh, we'll see how they look. Again, that's Thursday at uh, Cuckendale Stadium in Frisco, formerly Memorial Stadium, and that's a 7 o'clock start. So uh, 
beat the traffic down to Frisco if you can uh, to get them on time for sure. Um, the other This week we also have another district game, and that is the Dennis and Yale Jackets. Uh, they will be jumping into their district action uh, in 7-5A Division II. Uh, the number doesn't stay the same for their district. Or the number stays the same in their district, but there are some new opponents, and one of them is this week, uh, and that is Greenville. Denison is going to Greenville on Friday night. Uh, Denison is 2-1. and one. They uh, won last week 35-28 uh, in overtime against Kennedale, and Greenville comes in at 1-2. and two. Uh, They lost their game last week uh, against Chapel Hill 69-20. Um, so this is this is an interesting um, an interesting district uh, to be sure. And I'll start with just sort of the district overview because uh, once we start getting into with everybody doing districts, we'll, we'll kind of do that for everybody. Um, and so this is a new district. Um, I guess it's a 50-50 district if, if we want to be honest um, because um, you still have Denison, you still have Princeton, you still have uh, uh, Lovejoy. Those are the three that are the holdovers. Um, but then they added in Crandall, they added in Terrell, Greenville, of course, Melissa in moving up from 4A, and Mesquite Poteet, which dropped down and was actually in Sherman's district last year, um, and now they're, uh, now they're in Dennis's district. So that's, a, that's an interesting little note. Um, the other interesting note about this district is Denison and Crandall are the only two teams that, are under, are, that have winning records th- uh, so far this season, heading into district play. Crandall's 3-0. Denison is two and one. Uh, Princeton, Lovejoy, Terrell, Greenville, and Melissa are all one and two, and Mesquite Poteet is zero and three. So that's kind of interesting that you have um, you have some teams now. Obviously, in 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 the case of somebody like Lovejoy, um, you know they played some pretty tough people um, to open up. Uh, Melissa sort of the same way. Uh, both of them, uh, I believe, both of them. Um, you know, I think both of them played Argyle. Um, I haven't done a full a full deep dive into um, yes yeah so both Melissa and Lovejoy decided to play Argyle which God bless them for doing that uh, obviously Denison did scrimmage against them but it's one thing to scrimmage somebody and it's another to uh, to play them in a um, to play them in a scrimmage or play them in a real game uh, we we've talked about Princeton you know the last couple of weeks just because uh, they were an opponent of of Sherman um, obviously and Denison's familiar with them. Uh, it, it's weird because the, the two holdovers um, that the last two years, uh, Denison has beaten Princeton both years, and they've lost to Lovejoy both years. So um, there is some familiarity there, but obviously some new faces. Um, some people love that. Some people don't. Um, obviously, there's one less team that you have to beat. Um, you know, the last couple of years, Denison would have been starting district last week um, and playing an eight-game schedule. They're only playing seven um, because the district is one team smaller. So I don't – a lot of people say Denison is the third best team, the fourth best team, depending on, you know, how you want to analyze um, some of the matchups or whatever. Um, but I think a lot of people firmly have them as a, um, as a, playoff, a playoff team. Um, I know, like I said, we talked the records don't look like it. Um, but Lovejoy is, I think, still the favorite, um, even though they're one and two, obviously – um, Crandall would disagree because they're three and and they probably feel pretty good about their chances. Um, I think I think if we're looking at if you're looking at it from the Yellow Jacket standpoint, um, they are um, I think their direct competition for a playoff spot or slash seeding. Um, the games that you're obviously going to look at are uh, Melissa, Lovejoy, and Crandall, uh, and I think Terrell. That may be the decider in terms of do you get in or not. Um, and that's a game that's, that's, a, um, I don't want to say right around the corner, um, because there is a buy mixed in, um, uh, before Denison gets to Terrell. Um, so it's going to be or in, in October before we see, um, uh, before we see them play Terrell. But I think those, I think those are the five teams that everybody agrees are probably above the other, um, the other three. Um, I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see can, can Princeton, Greenville, and Mesquite Poteet uh, get in that mix? Um, and obviously, the the game uh, the game the game Friday against the Lions that's going to be uh, you know not a deciding factor, but obviously an interesting measuring point um, right off the bat to see uh, in the early going where we are. Now, the one thing to note about this matchup is um, 
Greenville has allowed at least 30, 31 points every game this this year. Um, so that's uh, something to watch out that, that maybe that, you know, their defense is not as good as they would like it to be. Um, from the looks of them, uh, scouting wise, Micah Simpson um, is a guy they kind of put all over the field. Um, they put him at quarterback. They put him in the backfield as a running back. They put him out and as a wide receiver to get the ball in his hands. Um, he's an athletic, uh, electric sort of player. You, you try to get him the ball as many times as you can um, to kind of make him do something. So obviously he's going to be uh, the focal point. And if you're if you're Greenville, um, the one thing you have to worry about with these Yellow Jackets is um, there's no quit. There's no um, there's no lack of of you know Coach Whitson has has said the last couple of weeks a lack of pride. Um, and you saw that this last week in a game where um, they fell behind early. Um, they were behind. Um, they fell behind in the second half, um, and they were down, and they were down going to the fourth quarter. But again, uh, they find a way to win a game. Uh, they get a tying touchdown in the fourth quarter. Uh, they were able to force overtime uh, thanks to some turnovers. Uh, they score on fourth down in the overtime to start the overtime, and then they stop Cannondale uh, on their possession to win 35-28. Um, uh, we talked last week the Denison ground game was um, horrendous against Frisco Reedy. Uh, lots of lots of problems trying to move the ball on the ground. Uh, this week, not so much. Uh, rushing for almost 300 yards and uh, almost having three 100-yard rushers. Uh, leading the way, Josh Kurtenbach uh, at the quarterback spot, 17 carries, 100 yards, and three touchdowns. Uh, Jack Allman had 15 carries for 86 yards and uh, a touchdown. And then Grant Yerkes had 14 carries for 94 yards. So, um, a couple more carries in that game, um, and and those two guys would have gotten to 100 as well. Um, so a much better, a much better, uh, a much better feeling. Obviously, uh, it was it was it was a, a good bounce back win. Obviously, you know we talked about last year. Kennedale is one of those teams. Uh, they have really good athletes. You know they had, um, you know they have a, a kid at linebacker that's committed to Oklahoma State. They have a kid at uh, safety that's committed to Kansas State. So they've got athletes. They they have success. They go to the playoffs every year. Um, they're usually competing for district titles every year. Um, so, um, just, that was just, it was, it was, it wasn't as similar as the Sherman game. Obviously they were down, uh, multiple touchdowns in that one and it didn't go to overtime, but it definitely had the same feel of, you know, they're hanging around and they're, you know, they're going to put together something at some point. Uh, and they were able to do that. And, and like I said, there were, there were, um, there were three fumbles, uh, that Kennedy had in the final 15 minutes. Uh, they had a chance to go. They had a chance to go up two scores. Um, fumbled at the one yard line. Denison literally falls on it. The ball's in the end zone. They get a touchback, and then two other uh, fumbles near midfield um, that Denison recovered as well to be able to um, to keep Kennedale from uh, going back in front after Denison had tied it at 28 um, with uh, about seven and a half minutes to go. So um, so good showing there. The other I guess the other touchdown to mention. Uh, and that one, Kurtenbach also, you know, he didn't throw for a lot of yards. He only had 80. Um, there weren't a lot of attempts. He only, they only threw the ball 13 times. Uh, as they, they ran it 40. This was a grinded out game, uh, both sides. Uh, you know, both teams almost ran it near 50 times apiece. Um, and, and, but Kurtenbach did have a, a 31 yard touchdown to Kyson Lusane um, in, the, in the second quarter, kind of um, to jumpstart things uh, to tie the game. And then, um, Denison went up uh, on its next possession uh, before falling behind there in the third quarter. So um, again, a, a, another gritty game. That both their wins have been uh, have been fourth quarter, you know, rallies, uh, one to win in regulation, one to force overtime. Um, I think obviously Denison would like to not have that happen every week, um, but wins are wins, and especially now that we're in district play, those are the ones you want to get. So um, gonna be interesting to see what happens when Denison goes to Greenville, uh, especially because Lovejoy is looming. Uh, and you want to you want to bank what you can get before you face um, some of these other teams um, down the road. But uh, Greenville is going to be an interesting matchup for sure uh, to start off district play. Um, moving down to all the other games that are non-district, we do have a couple of all local matchups again, which is great. We always say this is that's what we want to see locals playing locals, bragging rights, and what that brings. Uh, and the first matchup that we'll talk about. Uh, is uh, White Wright traveling to SNS? Uh, White Wright is two and one after they lost their first game of the season last week, 49 to nothing against Honeygrove. Uh, while SNS still seeking that first win, they're 0 and three. 
uh, and they lost last week 49-7 against Collinsville. This was a district game the last couple years. Um, it was the deciding factor in people getting to the playoffs. Uh, two years ago, SNS won their game, won that game uh, in a defensive slugfest uh, to advance to the playoffs as the last seed. Um, and then uh, the last year, White Wright won 14 to nothing, and that was the difference. Uh, White Wright got the last spot over SNS. Um, this has never been a non-district game. All the previous matchups had had been in district play, but of course, uh, White Wright dropped down to 2A, and so uh, that is why. Um, we're not seeing these guys again with uh, with having it uh, count for something. Um, just to touch quickly on the games last week, because um, um, based on the – unfortunately, when, when you com- have a combined uh, seven points between the two of them, uh, not a lot happened on the offensive side. Uh, in SNS's loss, uh, Chase Sloan had the touchdown uh, in the fourth quarter as SNS avoided the shutout there. Um, only had 94 yards, only had uh, seven first downs. Um Sloan led the way with uh, eight carries for 37 yards. Um, passing game only picked up 10 yards. Um, so obviously a struggle against a team that we'll talk about uh, in Collinsville here in a little bit that is undefeated and is, and is uh, you know, pretty pretty much rolling along uh, going to their big showdown this week. Um, and then White Wright, um, you know, two, had two good wins. Um, things were looking good. Um, and, and then it, uh, they fell behind early in this one. They were down 21-0 after the first quarter. And things kind of um, snowballed for, from there. Um, obviously, um, struggling offensively. They only had 53 yards last week. Um, uh, their, their, their quarterback, who has been their filling quarterback, um, but had started since the beginning of the season, Tyler Ball, um, uh, dealing with an injury. Um, so he's going to be out a little bit, so I don't know if that changes uh, the equation uh, for what Warrior wants to do uh, this week against SNS. Um, and 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 so that was, that was sort of a struggle. Um, you know, White Red had been running the ball. Um, you know, they, they, they had been playing really good defense. Um, you know, they had allowed only 19 points uh, combined in the first two games. So it's going to be interesting to see how they can bounce back. Obviously, dealing with some injuries, um, you know, what are they going to be able to do? And obviously, SNS just trying to find some positives. Now that, you know, they've played, um, they've played some good people. Like we said, Collinsville um, is, is looking really good right now. Um, so uh, Tioga... Uh, is expected to be, you know, they were playoff team last year. They they were expecting to to go back again this year. Um, so I don't know if you can you say, talk about the, the 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 teams that they've lost to. You know, I don't know if there's any shame in losing to those because I think three, you know, we could they could go three for three on on those teams being in the playoffs. And and obviously, you know, this could be another one with White Red as well, uh, depending on th- how things go in their district. But um, you know, I I think obviously just trying to get some momentum going there at S and S is um is what. You know, you have a new coach, and you have guys doing some new things, and um, you know it hasn't really, it hasn't really meshed and gelled yet. Um, you know, obviously they're they're giving up, um, they've given up in the 40s. Um, you know, defensively, um, in all three games, um, and the offense is actually, um, you know, taking a step back each week, um, as well. So um, I think you, just, I think you're just trying to find some some positive notes, um, and this might be a chance to. You know, to get that uh, as you're getting ready for a district play, um, you know, this is a team, like we said, uh, you played close last year. Um, you know, they're looking their wounds right now, so maybe this is a chance to jump on them um, because they're coming off a lopsided loss, and, and maybe you can – it's at your place. I think it's, it's homecoming this week, I believe. So it's, it's, it is that time of homecoming for a lot of people. So um, maybe you throw all that together, and, and if you're SNS, you come out of this. And even if, it's, even if you don't get a win, you know, if you just play better – um, you go to the fourth quarter and it's a game that's uh, you're in the fight for. You've got a chance to go and do something. Um, maybe that's uh, a little something to build on for the games that really count. And 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 you know people say this all the time. Everybody wants to win every game. We know that. But um, you know we've uh, you know we've seen it here. We've seen it. You see it at a lot of places. You know. And we'll talk about a team that that is in the position of this with Brock. Um, just because you're losing games in non-district doesn't mean you're going to go and not do something in district play. We have seen teams go 0 and 5 in non-district for whatever reason, injuries, a you know, some you you play a tough schedule and some some bounces don't go your way. You go 0 and 5 and then they go 5 and 0 in district. And people forget about the 0 and 5 they remember, hey, we were district champs, and we went to the first or second round because 
um, we had the top seed because we were the, we were the district champion. So, um, you know, all schedules are not created equal. All situations are not created equal. Um, but the one thing we know is once you get district play, those are the ones that matter, um, and nothing else does. And if you win games in your district and you get to the playoffs, then, um, you know, I think a lot of teams would take that over, you know, winning all your non-district games, and then you get into district, and then you don't end up making the playoffs. And it's like, well, that's great we won those games, but that didn't help us in what we wanted to do once we got to district play. So that should be interesting. That's an interesting matchup for a couple reasons. And then the other local matchup that we have, um, which I thought before the season maybe could have been 3-0 and against 3-0, and uh, but it is going to be 2-1 and Tioga at 2-1 and Howe. Still a very interesting matchup. Um, Tioga coming off a 42-39 to win against Valley View, and Howe is coming off its, its first loss, uh, 59 to 42 against Commerce. Um, this is uh, going to be an interesting game for a couple reasons. So one, you have we'll talk about the how loss. Um, you put up 42 points, thinking that like that's great. 42 points should get you a win. Um, unfortunately, uh, and this is sort of the amazing thing of it was so what uh, how had over 400 yards of offense, um, put up 42 points, and they had five turnovers. And obviously that is. Um, pretty much the difference. Uh, partly because one of those turnovers was returned for a touchdown, and an interception return for a touchdown. Um, and then you throw in a special teams. Uh, they gave up a kickoff return for a touchdown as well. And then you throw in, you know, the four other, uh, the four of the turnovers. Uh, now, yes, Commerce had three, um, so that was pretty close. But, um, you know, how was probably looking at that saying, man, we should be 3-0. Um, you put up 42 points in the game. You should, you should probably win most of those. Um, and then, um, talking about putting up 42 points, um, Tyler, did the same thing, uh, and they were able to hang on against Valley View. Um, so I think we have, I think we have some offenses that can do some damage. Um, we see how last week, again, um, what we said, they put up over, they had a very balanced attack, over 200 yards rushing, over 200 yards passing. Uh, Austin Haley was 13 of 22 passing, 233 yards, um, three touchdowns, all to Cooper Jones, had a huge game. Four catches, 126 yards, three touchdowns. Uh, Colin Murphy chipped in five catches for 74 yards. Um, Haley also had a touchdown run uh, as part of nine carries for 69 yards. Uh, Antoine Rattler uh, led the way on the ground, 14 carries, 87 yards, and two touchdowns. Um, and so that's an offense that obviously, you know, they've been uh, much improved. We, we talked about it, obviously, getting off to the 2-0 start. Um, you know, they won a close game against Honey Grove. Uh, pulled that out just to get the confidence going. Um, they beat Tom Bean. They put up 49 last week against Tom Bean and uh, put up 42 this week, but unfortunately it came in a loss. And then Tioga, um, they are doing what they're doing. You know, they're, they're overcoming injuries. Um, you know, they're, they're leading rusher the first two games. Uh, Johnny Dorpinghouse didn't play in this one. Um, he's sidelined, probably going to be back uh, for district. So he's not expected to play um, this week, but, uh, Jonah Grubbs steps in, um, got some run last week as as uh, a sidekick because Chase Evans was out, so Ev- so he was the sidekick to Dorpinghouse, and then Evans came back and Dorpinghouse went out of the lineup. So, uh, but Jonah Grubbs was the big guy in this one. 24 carries, 191 yards, and two touchdowns. Uh, Chase Evans back in the lineup, uh, 18 carries for 71 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Alex Batista scores on the ground. Um, Austin Norwood, uh, still at quarterback, scores on the ground um, with a long touchdown. Um, not a lot on the way of the passing game, but when you're when you run for 354 yards, um, you know you can afford to to not have that really clicking. Um, and so obviously you know what Tioga wants to do; they want to run the ball, um, and it's going to be interesting. Now the one interesting thing about this matchup off of um, their games last week. Um, Valley View could not run the ball at all against um, Tioga's defense, but they did throw for almost 400 yards, um, and I believe all of their touchdowns, yes, all of their touchdowns were passing touchdowns. So, and a lot of them were from distance. There's one for 56, you know, one for 43. Um, these weren't little cheapies, you know, drive it down, get it close, and, you know, get a little three-yard touchdown pass or something. One of them was, but the other ones weren't. Um, and so... If you're Howe and you have a quarterback like Austin Haley who can sling it, um, you know, is the best quarterback in school history, he's pass, you know, surpassing all the career total yards, touchdowns, all that sort of stuff, um, 
he's the, you know they've they've moved the ball really well through the air and it hasn't been the same guy you know last week we talked about Ryan Huff had the big game um you know this week he only has one catch you know this week Cooper Jones has the big game uh Braden Ulmer had a big game uh, early on um so they've they've kind of spread it around a little bit you never know which guy is going to be the guy on that certain night and so um that's probably something that that Howe's looking at you know hey t- you know Collinsville um, threw it pretty good against them to give them their 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 only loss. Um, Valley View nearly came back. Um, you know they were down three touchdowns going to the fourth quarter. Valley View was they scored twice um, to get to get as close as they did, but Tyler was able to hang on. Um, so it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting to see you know how this one plays out. Um, and again, you have. Um, you have a how program that looks like it's uh, it's it's on the rise, um, you know, off of off of last season with the new coach and everything, uh, and they and they're they've got uh, they've got some they want to keep that momentum going in a district play uh, for sure. And if you're Tioga, um, again, same thing. Um, your district's right around the corner. Um, maybe for them, the biggest thing might be can we keep some guys healthy? Because um, obviously, you know, they have big goals after making the playoffs last year. Um, you don't want to get guys. You want guys healing up and not getting hurt. So, but I think this is again this both of the local matchups are, are really intriguing, um, and I'm just I'm glad that we have we've had those um, you know every week since the season started. Um, you know, teams teams of the same level playing each other, hopefully leading to great games, um, and we'll see what happens when Tioga goes. And this is also I will point out because I do this every week. This is also a seven o'clock start uh, at How Tioga at How on Friday night, but it is a seven o'clock start. So make sure to note that. Uh, if you're going to head out to that game uh, on Friday. Um, the big showdown that has lost a little bit of luster, um, but it still, uh, it still is going to have a lot of eyes on it. Uh, Gunner goes to Brock. Uh, Gunner is 2-0. Uh, they won last week 41-0 against Trinity Christian Addison. While Brock is 0-3, and, and I know you're saying, huh, what, Brock is 0-3. Uh, they lost 32-23 to against Wimberley. Um, so... Much like, uh, and Gunner people listening to this will understand, um, much like Gunner had problems trying to find uh, opponents to fill out their schedule, and that's why they're playing one, that's why they didn't have a game in game week one because three teams bailed on them and they couldn't find a replacement. Uh, while, they, while you're playing a Trinity Christian Addison, um, who's a large, much bigger school than you in taps um, last week, why you're going, why, you, why this is even happening with Brock, um, because... They, you have two schools that have been so good the last, you know, five, six, seven years that they they can't find anybody to play them. Um, so they they said let's play each other. Uh, Brock is three A Division one, uh, started the season number one there. Gunner, uh, one of the favorites in three A Division two, number one depending on what poll you were looking at. And you know, in a normal season, I, this would be three and over three and O, the number one team in each division in 3A playing each other, and it would have a lot more uh, hype to it. Um, but unfortunately, Brock has had to play um, Wichita Falls Hershey, which they lost to in overtime, 37-30. to 30. Uh, Then they went and played... Um, let me find them here on my schedule. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The Hershey game was, was week two. Uh, they lost to um, Pleasant Grove, Texarkana Pleasant Grove, 28 to 7. Then they lost the game to Hershey, 37 to 30 in overtime. And then this last week they lost 32 to 23 um, against Wimberley. All those are five 4A programs. Obviously, Pleasant Grove is always good. Um, Hershey, I think, went to the either the semifinals or the quarterfinals um, this last year. Um, and so th- they played a ridiculous schedule um, to get ready for their district, which starts next week. Um, and so I would. It doesn't throw the record out. You're going to Brock. Brock still is among the favorites, regardless of the three losses. Um, I think this is going to be a really great game. And the best part is, is this is a total bragging rights game. This is we're making ourselves better by playing. Maybe, I mean, very easily, the week before Christmas, it is very possible that these two teams play on the same day and both win the state championship in their respective divisions in 3A as part of that doubleheader. Um, obviously, Brock was – they were both runners-up last year. Um, 
even though graduation hit both of them, um, they are expected to at least probably go that far again and be in the championship game. So you can say all you want about Brock being 0 3 and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Don't trust me. That's it's it's a you you have to know who they've played and know that one they could easily be two and one with that schedule uh, based on the results. But but they had to play some people because nobody wanted to play them. Um, and much like nobody wanted to play Gunner, and here we are for this great matchup. And it's going to be a great matchup next year because the the you know they're both going to expect to be in this uh, spot for in 2023. Um, making another deep playoff run, doing the things that they've they've basically done, uh, you know, these last couple of years, um, you know, Gunner going on trying to make this the seventh year in a row. Where they 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 win the region and and Brock kind of doing the same thing in the, in their region out in Region One. Um, but Gunner is coming off, uh, you know, I, I thought a very interesting um, final score. We said last week I don't know what to expect from this game. Obviously, they're playing a, a opponent that has a much bigger enrollment than they do. Even though they were, they had lost a couple games. Um, you know, this is a team. This, that's a program that Denison has played. So that's a 5A team. Um, you know, that has played them in the last five or six years to kind of give you a gauge of the kind of level in UIL that Trinity Christian Assets is normally playing. And this was a game at halftime. It's only 10 to nothing. And I wonder if people were like, I don't know if that's a good thing that Gunner's actually getting some um, somebody to push them. Because obviously in the first game it was against Trinity leadership, um, it was 60 to nothing in the second quarter. So obviously Gunner was getting pushed, which I think I'm sure the coaches loved because um, it puts them in an interesting situation. And then uh, you hate to say they do what Gunner does. Um, so we're up 10 nothing. It's not maybe what people thought it was. Maybe uh, you know TCA is better than than what we think. And then they come out and put up four touchdowns um, in the fourth quarter and then the third quarter. And, and break this sucker open, and it's 38 nothing going to the fourth quarter. Um, for the second straight week, Gunner did not allow positive yards on the ground. Uh, TCA had 30 carries and lost six yards. Um, they had 78 yards passing, um, and that was it. Um, and again, we, we did this last week. Um, even in a game that was close at halftime, um, Gunner doesn't have the big, um, you know, the big statistical guys. Uh for the second street week, Ivy Hellman, five carries, 45 yards, touchdown run, um, also caught a 43-yard touchdown pass uh, from Luke Dodd. Um, d- interesting, so for the second street week, um, Walker Overman and Dodd have split snaps. Um, I don't know if that's just a, that's what we're going to do this year thing, or that's a, we're doing this to find out who's going to be our quarterback, our, like our number one quarterback. Um, but they're both playing really well. Uh, Overman goes 9 of 14 for 104 yards, and Dodd goes 8 of 10 for 100. Uh, they both throw a touchdown pass. Overman's goes to uh, Ethan Sloan, who had three catches for 53 yards and added uh, five carries for 33 yards. Um, Ashton Bennett, uh, five carries, 37 yards, and a touchdown. Hayden Farrell, um, second, uh, second week in a row, right place, right time for a touchdown. Uh, in this one, he uh, he falls on a fumble uh, in the end zone after Braden Hinton uh, is sacking the quarterback. Ball pops out. He falls on it. Um, he returned uh, the block punt last week, um, so he's been he's been in the right place at the right time. Um, and and if you worry about uh, and again, this is a chance for in these games to see these sort of things. Um, Preston Tarpley, you know, takes over a kicker this year, um, kicks a pair of field goals. The one for 23, you say, okay, that's whatever. But he made a 39-yarder in the fourth quarter. So um, that's a, another weapon, you know, like Gunner needs it. But to have a kid that can kick from almost 40 yards um, is, is going to be a weapon at some point. You never know when that's going to matter. Uh, and then the leading receiver in this one, Cannon Lemberg, uh, seven catches for 67 yards. Um, but like I said, no big numbers. Uh, you know, you look at it and you go one, two, three, four, five, six. Eight different guys caught passes. Uh uh, nine different guys ran the ball, so um, it, it you know you're not gonna have you're not gonna have eye popping numbers when your leading carry guy only gets seven carries, um, you know, or out of your out of your other receivers after you know there's there's five guys with one catch and that's all they get. So, but this I think this is gonna be a great game, Gunnar at Brock on Friday. Um, obviously the return game is gonna be here next year. Um. I wish this was. I wish this game was was here this year, but um, it's going to be interesting to see 
Um, you know, Gunners had two home games, so they're going to go on the road uh, to mess with Brock uh, on Friday night. And I think that's, you know, even though even though the record for Brock is 0-3, I still think there's going to be a lot of people looking to see um, how that score comes out for sure on uh, Friday night. Uh, next game on the list, uh, Van Alstein is going to be hosting Sulphur Springs. Uh, Sulphur Springs comes in at 2-1. and one. They lost their first game last week, 34-21 to 21 against Hallsville. And uh, Van Alstein is coming off a 68-25 to 25 loss against Anna. Um, I guess I jinxed it when I said all Anna and Van Alstein do is play close games um, because they had been. And unfortunately, in this one, Anna jumps up real big early. Uh, it's 41-8 to eight at halftime. Uh, and Van Alstein was never able to really play catch up in this one. Um, they did have, you know, they, they, they did have the yardage. Um, they just weren't able to, you know, to finish off some drives. It looks like um, turnovers weren't really a problem. Um, they, they only had the one, uh, only had one, one fumble. Uh, Jade Mahan led the way, 28 carries for 130 yards. Uh, Weston Johnson had seven carries, 59 yards, and uh, two touchdown runs. Um, he also threw. Uh, an 80-yard touchdown pass to Brady Carson, um, but uh, again we said last week the 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 um, the efficiency in the passing game uh, has been an issue. Johnston goes you know six of 21, um, you know does have does have an interception, um, also um, uh, only threw for 133 yards. Like we said, 80 of it came on uh, the one touchdown. Um, now Ann is really good. Um, you know, they're, they're playing Salina this week in, in, a, in a battle of, of ranked teams. Um, so I think, I think Anna was up to number six in the state in, uh, in 4A Division One this week. Um, so that's a huge game for them. Um, and and they've, got some, they've got some weapons. And I don't, you know, I think obviously it's, it's I think Van Alstein is still sort of trying to find their way um, with some of the changes from last year. Um, you know, trying some guys in new positions, you're seeing – um, you're seeing Jackson Allen a lot more in the backfield. Um, you're seeing some other guys starting to slide in some other spots um, to try to make some uh, try to make some plays. And so um, this this is going to be interesting because um, one, you have a Silver Springs program that has been down. Um, you know, they haven't had a lot of success the last couple years, um, and they're coming here. Um, and so you would hope that you, that um, it'd be a situation where. You can have uh, Van Alstine bounce back as as they're starting to get uh, closer to district play as well. Um, you know they had the, the first game we went. You know the first game against Pottsboro, close game could have gone either way. Um, and then they won with the comeback against Lebanon Trail. And you're thinking, okay, um, let's see what they let's let's see if they can kind of keep sort of that momentum going, keep that keep it going. And then then Anna just jumped on them and and um, they weren't able to keep pace. So um, gonna be interesting to see if Van Alstine can bounce back and what they do against Sulphur Springs um, on Friday night. Um, uh, another interesting game. Uh, we've got actually a couple of them coming up because just of the history of of the, of the teams. Uh, Bells is going to go to Pilot Point on Friday. Uh, Bells is two and one. They bounced back last week, won forty eight to seven against Paris Chisholm. And Pilot Point is actually uh, coming off a loss. They're one and two. They lost a close one last week, twenty one eighteen against Farmersville. Um, so so we talked about last week. Obviously, um, Bells not afraid to play anybody. Um, Really good schedule to start their season. They lost the game to Whitesboro, game they almost won in the end. Unfortunately, well, you know they they scored to go ahead, and then fortunately Whitesboro had the ball last, so they won. Uh, but then this week, uh, no need to worry about that. Um, they jump up on Paris Chisholm. They were up forty-one nothing at halftime. Um, you know they they they, they kind of they were able to cruise, and 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 that was good to see with them. Uh, uh, Spencer Hines led the way in this one. Three carries for 105 yards and a touchdown. Um, he also caught uh, two passes for 78 yards and uh, a touchdown pass from uh, from Jacob Aaron. Uh, Bells only threw it twice. They completed the two passes, both to Hines, and that was that. Um, Aaron also had a touchdown run. Uh, Grady Waldrop, three carries for 71 yards and two touchdowns. Peyton Washburn, three carries for 45 yards and two touchdowns. Um, so this was a game that was uh, was not very close. The defense um, almost got the shutout, couldn't finish it off, but they did hold Paris Chisholm to just nine first downs, uh, 145 yards, all on the ground on 40 carries. So that says how how tough the sledding was for Chisholm. Uh, they they threw three passes, no completions. One was an interception. 
Um, and that was Bell's bouncing back. Um, opponent's a little tough for this week. Uh, Power Point's a playoff team, has been a playoff team. Um, and so going to be interesting to see um, what the result of this one is just because you have, you have again, you have two teams expecting to make the playoffs. Um, you know, I, I think – I think Pilot Point coming off the loss last week, that was a, you know, I think maybe that was a game a lot of people thought that they would win. Um, and so, and they opened against uh, um, uh, Kalisberg, um, who Bells plays next week. So if you want to get sort of a gauge, Pilot Point won that game 28-13 uh, to 13 over Kalisberg, and that's who Bells has next week. So um, transitive property there, see, see, what they, see what the outcome is against Bells. Uh, Bell's pop point to see what Bell's Kalisberg might look like next week. Um, but again, it's, it's two teams that um, are willing to play each other to get to get themselves ready for district play, which is around the corner. Um, and then the other interesting game um, is Pottsboro's going to Munster. Um, this is a this is also a seven o'clock start on Friday, so note that if you're driving out to Munster, seven o'clock start. Um, Pottsboro is coming off the loss to Whitesboro, like we talked about, thirty-five twenty-seven. And Munster got their first win of the season last week, uh, 31-13 against Winthorst. Um, so obviously Munster's feeling better. Um, you know, they opened with a loss to Bells, uh, and then they, they lost again, which, you know, for a program like Munster, it's, you jump you jump into a season 0-2, you have a chance to fall to 0-3. Um, that stuff doesn't happen a lot in Munster. Um, if, if they had a loss last week, uh, they would have been 0-3 for the first time uh, since 2008. So that's how long it's been since they lost – uh, the first three games of their season. Um, and so so they're back on track, which is pr- maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing uh, for Pottsboro, uh, who's looking to bounce back um, You know, from their loss. Like we talked about, um, they had the lead. First play of the fourth quarter, they get a touchdown, and they're up. Um, and then they weren't able to score the rest of the game as, as Whitesboro rallied to win that game 35-27. Um, in that game, Major McBride, another another big game for him. 20 carries, 113 yards, and uh, three touchdown runs. Um, Also had five catches for 65 yards. Uh, Halen Flanagan, 22 of 30 passing, uh, 267 yards um, with with an interception. Um, He also ran 16 times for 64 yards and scored on the ground. Uh, And Reed Thompson led the way, receiving six catches, 118 yards. Uh, Jude Bentley added seven for 63 just again one you know the difference in one drive and and here and and or, or stop here and that's the difference and um you know possible could easily be three and um and again this is another matchup of teams that always make the playoffs are always in the mix and they're willing to play each other um so that's again that, that's going to be an interesting uh an interesting matchup just to see um you know did did, did Munster fix some things from the first couple games um, or, um, are, you know, are they, are they still, um, a, a beatable sort of foe? Um, I guess the one thing to watch in this one, um, Pottsboro has been kind of penalty happy, um, to, in each of their games this year, you know, around double digits every game. Um, you can't, you can't have that many penalties or that many accepted penalties, um, against good teams all the time. You know, they've been able to get away with it maybe, maybe once or twice, um, I'm sure it, it didn't help last week when they, they had 10 penalties, um, you know, for 76 yards. And you throw in two turnovers, and, and um, that makes life difficult for yourself, especially in a game that's, you know, a seven-point margin that you think you could pull out. So, um, but again, it's another interesting matchup. And again, it's at 7 o'clock, Pottsboro going to Munster uh, on Friday night. Um, two more games. Um, Tom Bean is at Como Picton. Uh, Tom Bean is 1-2. and two. After they lost last week, 21-7 against Chico, and Como Picton uh, is one and two after they lost 51-6 against Queen City. Um, this was a game uh, that that they have played the last couple years. Um, Como Picton won last year, 31-6. Uh, but obviously, this is a this is a an, an improved Tom Bean team. Um, they are uh, they are better. Um, you know, they they they, are, they won a game, so that's obviously improvement when they won the opener. Um, then against Howe, took us a little bit of a step back, but then in this game against Chico, you know, it's 21-7. Uh, it was tied at halftime. Uh, Bobby Rogers caught uh, an 11-yard touchdown pass from Branson Ashlock. Um, 
Uh, Gavin Hamilton finished with 15 carries for 65 yards. Um, DJ Pearson, seven catches for 67 yards. Um, there is no doubt that Tom Bean is better. The question, of course, is to what degree, as you try to dig out of an 0-9 hole, um, and, and just as an example, in three games this year, and that's with, this is with a 49-6 to loss in there, in, in, and the seven points um, in the last game, Tom Bean has already scored more points in the first three games this year than it did in all nine games last season. So that says what you're trying to to get out of and build a foundation and just be just be competitive. And again, so this is a game here where you have a direct game from last year where you can say, "Hey, we lost to this team 31-6. If we win this game, it's obviously a different um it's obviously a different uh, result entirely. But what if we lose this game by a touchdown? That just shows the improvement that this this program is trying to make. And at this time, I'll also um mention for those who didn't see of course I'm, I'm assuming everybody did at this point um it was after the podcast was recorded last week um but the uh the 6-2-A division one uh com- executive committee uh ruled and voted that tom bean had uh committed recruiting violations uh, and was to they banned them from the playoffs for the next three years that's this coming season and the next two seasons um Tom Bean is appealing that, so um, they're appealing that to the state executive committee. It's probably going to be heard by the end of the month, maybe the first week of October. They go in the order um, from all the cases that they get around the state. Um, they go in the order that they were are, are, are received, and that was received literally last week. And there's cases that were heard earlier this week that date back into August. So there still is a couple weeks lag time um to see what happens there uh the the state executive committee can uphold um the punishment um they can reduce it by any number of years or they could just say we don't agree that this is there's recruiting violations so anything is on the table um there could be no ban there could be a one year a two year or the three year um if i'm leaning towards something i think it might be a two year ban just based off of of um if you're gonna if you're going to deny eligibility and this is and this is the interesting thing because i know people and i even thought it last week um the state executive committee did hear three cases for student athlete eligibility last week from tom bean they denied all three but the thing about that was those are technically connected to the recruiting allegation decision but they there's not a cause and effect so they're hurt individually, but I'm sure I'm assuming that's going to be used as part of the evidence in the hearing in the appeal for the recruiting violations and the banned playoff appearances. I think that they're going to say, well, you've already ruled these kids ineligible. And the reason you ruled them ineligible is part of this larger um, situation. And there are going to I think there are going to be some more eligibility individual eligibility cases from Tom Bean and if they continue to be denied I don't know how the Tomcats can avoid getting a ban of some length I don't think they'll I don't think they'll keep the three years and the only reason I don't think they'll keep the three years is because we don't know what district Tom Bean's going to be in in three years so basically the current group is punishing them against opponents that they may not they may not they don't even know who they are if they get moved to another district or something so I, I think they they'll probably cover 2022 and 2023, um, but what with the U with when you get when things get to the UIL level, you never know. We have seen that in cases they make decisions that sometimes don't make sense. You think it's gonna go one way and it goes a completely other way. I've you know I've been doing this job long enough and we've had cases that go down there and you think I, I there's cases I've thought there's no way they're going to overturn that. And they do, and I think there's no way they're going to, um, they're going to, uh, you know, uh, let that stand, and they do. So you just know, it's it's fifty fifty, and it's sort of played out when you look at the numbers, which is something I've done in the past, just to kind of get a sense of it. It literally is almost a fifty fifty, um, split of over, you know, upholding a previous decision or overturning. It's not slanted one way or another. 
Um, it, it usually is right down the middle. So we'll obviously keep an eye out on that. And whenever that happens, whether it's um, the last week of September, the first week of October, we'll, we'll get back in and, uh, and talk about what that means, um, the, regardless of what the, um, you know, the punishment is. Right now, um, because there is an appeal, it's, it's, it's not really worth talking about because we'll talk about it and then it could change. So once the official ruling is made, um, obviously we'll have a story on it and we will, um, we'll talk about it more in depth about what it means for that district. Um, which will be in district play by that point. So it's kind of weird that Tom means going to start, you know, everybody in that district is going to start playing games and you have to assume you've got a chance to make the playoffs until you, you're told you don't, um, for, you know, however it shakes out. So that is obviously an interesting twist for when that district starts to play. Uh, and the last game, uh, Collinsville is going to be hosting Cooper. This is again, is also a seven o'clock start Friday night. Um, this is a matchup of undefeated. It's 3-0 versus 3-0. Um, from that standpoint, I think it's one of the more interesting um, uh, games on the schedule at the lower levels. Um, so Cooper is 3-0. They won big last week, 73-18 against Lone Oak. Uh, and Collinsville won big 49-7 against SNS. We mentioned that as they were getting to 3-0. Um, some of the highlights for the Pirates in that one. Um, uh, Der- uh, Der- Logan Jenkins, again... Uh, with another big game, um, you know, he threw for uh, 262 yards, 23 of 34, uh, but five touchdown passes. Um, uh, he also ran for a touchdown. Um, didn't have a huge uh, game running this week uh, as he had the previous two. Only had only had to run three times for 36 yards, um, but did have the big night passing. Uh, three of those touchdowns were in the direction of Nathan Bocanegra. Seven catches for 77 yards and three TDs. Uh, Carter Scott actually led with in receiving six catches for 108 yards. Uh, he also had a touchdown. Uh, Connor Ragsdale added a touchdown. Um, and I who did I miss for t- no that's five touchdowns. Uh, and then on the ground, Landon Spivey, uh, 16 carries for 126 yards and a touchdown as well. Uh, and this was a game where Collinsville was up 42 to nothing at halftime. Uh, we mentioned obviously. SNS struggled defensively or offensively. Collinsville holding them to 94 yards. Um, we talked about it last week. Collinsville's offense has been really good. Uh, they just missed getting to 50 points again uh, after doing it the first two games. Um, last week, they, you know, two weeks ago against Blue Ridge, they had to because it was a shootout. Um, um, so I don't, I don't know. And this is, I guess this is another game we talked about earlier. Um, these teams have played, you know, the last two years. Uh, Cooper won this game last year, 47 to 14. Um, so there's some semblance of um, who might have an edge just off of that. Um, I will note that a victory by the Pirates would match their win total from last season. And if they do win this game and get to 4 0, they are going to be 4 0 for the first time since 2006. So a lot on the line in the long run. It may not. Um, it may not mean a lot. Um, in, in terms of, of, of anything as we get ready for district play, um, you know, there's the, we talked about it like with, um, with Denison's district, and we'll probably we'll end up talking about it when we get to Collinsville's district um, here soon. Um, they're one of the few teams that has a winning record in their district. Um, of course, Munster's one of the teams that has a losing record right now, so you can't necessarily go by that. But, but obviously, you know, as, as good a start as you could hope for the Pirates, um, like we said, they, they, they went 4-6 and six last year. Um, didn't make the playoffs, um, you know, have a chance to be 4-0 um, going into district play uh, coming up. I think, um, you know, they're, they're definitely um, they're definitely better than they were last year, but the question is, Cooper might be better. And like I said, th- that was a game that Cooper won last year. Um, so that's, but that's definitely one to keep an eye on um, because obviously someone's going to be 4-0 and I think maybe start to get a little more recognition um, when it comes to, you know, statewide rankings and all that stuff. I know that stuff is not exactly, um, you know, top of mind and, and people don't, um, you know, it's not, it's not a big deal, um, you know, in the, in the long run, but it is nice to have your season, um, you know, being recognized. Um, you know, I, I didn't mention it before. Um, and I feel bad for, it. I didn't mention it because I, I had seen the, seen the, the newest rankings that came out. Um, when we were talking about bells, um, there were a lot of upsets in 3A Division II uh, this week, and despite the loss, 
Um, Bells is ranked in the, the Texas football rankings. Um, they are, they are ranked sixth, um, you know, in the state. Um, New Gunner is number one, um, and Holiday is number two. So if you're a Bells and a Gunner fan, you are uh, interested in seeing that. Um, and then, um, but Bells is at six. Um, and so that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting spot for them. Um, but I, you know, like I said, I mentioned it for, um, for Conzo and Cooper because, um, neither one of them are, are ranked, um, in their respective, uh, divisions. Um, but I think, you know, a win, a win this week might get some people's attention. Um, I think maybe, maybe Collinsville more because I think there's a little bit, there's been a little bit more shakeup in the division two rankings. Um, um, so, you know, they, they, and they have Munster, you know, again, to say, you know, it, it, talk about who you're playing. Um, you know, Munster is ranked sixth in uh, class two, a division two, despite being one and two um, because of who they've played. Um, and Santo and who is also in uh, Collinsville's district uh, at their three, you know, they, they, and they, and uh, Collinsville are both well, off the three, no starts. They're ranked number nine this week. So um, there's going to be some interesting matchups in that district for uh, in a battle for a district championship. And if Collinsville can can win a couple more games, maybe maybe you'll have three teams um, in the top ten just from that district, um, which would be crazy. So um, so I know rankings don't matter, but that that's that's something to watch for. The winner of this game might be in a position to 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 get a little more notice on the on the statewide uh, scale as well. So. That's what's going to happen in week four. That's what happened in week three. Um, Thanks for listening, as always. Uh, We love to have people tuning in here on the podcast. Um, So, again, take note, Sherman is playing on Thursday. A lot of people are playing at 7 o'clock on Friday. So make sure to double-check to get there. You're going to the right time. Um, Enjoy the games. The weather's starting to cool down, so that's good. We're getting into that point. And like I said, things are – it's maybe cooling down outside, but it's heating up on the football field because – we got some teams in district play, and um, you know by the end of this month, everybody should be in district play, and that's when the real fun begins. Uh, and we'll be talking about it every week right here on the Herald Democrat Herald Democrat podcast. <laughs>